webinar, New USDA Resources for Shelters Feeding Youth and Families Experiencing Homelessness. Thank you for joining us today to hear about the expansion of USDA's food program to allow children and young adults under 25 years old to receive healthy meals at emergency shelters. USDA's Child and Adult Care Food Program can help ensure that children and youth experiencing homelessness are fed healthy meals and snacks and that shelters remain financially sustainable during this difficult time. We are happy to be joined today by a wide diversity of stakeholders from across the country, including family and youth serving homeless shelters, anti-hunger advocates, community-based organizations offering services to runaway and homeless youth, advocates for homeless families, children and youth, child and adult care food programs, state agencies, administrators, and sponsoring organizations, and then we also have a big turnout in the audience from the federal, other federal government agencies, such as HHS and HUD, including the nation, supporting efforts to provide assistance to homeless family and youth. You are all, all of you in our audience today, absolutely essential to the success of this new expansion of the Child and Adult Care Food Program. We have 679 people signed up, so we are really happy to have such a big audience. So thanks for joining us. Next slide, please. This webinar is co-hosted by Schoolhouse Connection and Feeding America along with the Food Research and Action Center. And we appreciate the partnership of Schoolhouse Connection and Feeding America, their expertise and the planning and the outreach that they did with us. So thank you very much to our co-sponsor. Next slide, please. So, in today's webinar, you will have an opportunity to learn details of this new expansion, hear what this provision means for emergency shelter providers and the children and youth they serve, and to receive tailored information on opportunities to implement this option and conduct outreach to help maximize the expansion. So, if we look at the agenda, we see we have excellent expert speakers, starting with USDA and then moving to homeless and CACFP community leaders and school-based speakers. Next slide, please. So the first thing we will be doing is that we will be hearing from USDA. We will be hearing from Susan Poneman, a longtime advocate for CACFP and a great and dedicated civil servant. She's a program analyst at USDA FNS, and she will explain the child and adult care food program, the basics, and then the new expansion and what it means for everyone who wants to use the new expansion. During the Q&A period, we will be joined by Angela Klein, who's the Director of Policy and Program Development Division, Child Nutrition Programs. We will also be joined by Alex, Alice McKinney. She's the new Chief, I think actually formally new today, Chief for the Community Meals Branch Policy and Program Development Division, Child Nutrition Programs. And then Andrea Farmer, the Chief of the Community Meals Program Monitoring Branch, um, Program Monitoring and Operational Support Division, Child Nutrition Programs. So we are joined by a full complement of USDA experts on the CACFP program. So I would like to um, turn it over to Susan Poneman. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you to everyone for tuning in to hear more about reimbursement for emergency shelters and at risk after school care centers that provide meals and snacks in the child and adult care food program. I want to share with you information about USDA's policy and resources for serving young adults. But first, let me give you some background about CACFP. Next slide, please. Through this program, USDA provides assistance to child care centers, family child care homes, adult daycare centers, emergency shelters, and at-risk after-school care centers. We support these program operators in providing nutritious foods that contribute to the wellness, healthy growth, and development of all children and youth, and also to the health and wellness of older chronically impaired adults. CACFP is available in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and Guam. And in 2019, we provided healthful meals and snacks to more than 4.7 million kids and close to 137,000 adults as a regular part of their daycare. 
and we also serve close to 9,000 residents of emergency shelters. Next. So CACFP benefits include nutritious meals and snacks, training, program assistance and monitoring, cash reimbursement, and USDA foods. And these benefits help improve the quality of nutrition and the quality of care for children and adult participants. CACFP, CACFP also helps keep the cost of daycare more affordable for many families. And the benefits extend not only to young children and adults receiving daycare, but also to older kids and young people through age 18 in at-risk centers and emergency shelters. So next, please. So COVID-19 exposed how hunger can afflict anyone during tough times. Throughout the pandemic, USDA has provided CACFP with flexibilities that are needed to ensure that kids and adult participants have safe and healthy meals. Next. And on this slide, you'll see a list of nationwide waivers that are currently in place through the end of June 2022. And the waivers allow non-congregate meals, flexible meal times, parent or guardian pickup of meals, meal pattern accommodations, area eligibility to all at-risk centers and daycare homes with higher reimbursement for family child care providers, and implementation of off-site monitoring by state agencies and sponsoring organizations. Next. So the response to COVID-19 has also provided USDA with new tools and funding to strengthen food security, improve nutrition security, and ensure equity and access to nutritious food to protect and promote health in all of our programs. The American Rescue Plan Act expanded several nutrition assistance programs to reach the populations that are most at risk of experiencing food hardship due to the pandemic, including the extension of CACFP to serve young adults who are homeless. And so here are the details. Um, next slide, please. The president signed ARP into law on March 11, 2021. It includes a provision under Section 1107 that raises the age limit for reimbursable meals served by emergency shelters. It allows emergency shelters and at-risk centers that are operated by emergency shelters to claim CACFP reimbursement for meals served to individuals who, at the time of the meal service, are under age. It does not make any other operational changes. All other requirements for emergency shelters and at-risk centers under the Richard B. Russell National School Lunch Act remain the same. And Section 1107 is temporary. Uh, it is in effect only until the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services lifts the public health emergency. USDA issued implementation guidance on April 9th and a set of questions and answers on June 7th. Uh, next slide, please. So let's take a look at what the requirements are for emergency shelters and at-risk centers to participate in CACFP. And then let's see how emergency shelters whose mission is serving youth can provide healthy meals to more young people under ARP. Next, please. Let's start with emergency shelters. Beginning on March 11th, ARP authorizes USDA to reimburse emergency shelters for meals and snacks served to young adults under age 25 through participation in CACFP during COVID-19. Next. Emergency shelter for CACFP purposes is defined in the regulations as an organization that serves young people who are 18 or under and experiencing homelessness. Next. To be eligible for CACFP, an emergency shelter must be an organization that provides temporary shelter and food service to, to young people 18 or under. The organization has to be public or private nonprofit. There are no licensing requirements, 
but emergency shelters have to meet state or local health and safety standards. And although an emergency shelter may enter into an agreement directly with the state agency, it may be easier to participate under an existing sponsoring organization. And to make it even easier, USDA has always encouraged states to streamline the paperwork for emergency shelters by taking the least restrictive approach in applying the regulations to day-to-day -to -day operations. Next. So emergency shelters may claim reimbursement for serving breakfast, lunch, and supper each day to each young person under age 25 using the meal pattern for ages 13 through 18. And larger portions may be served to meet the nutritional needs of growing teens and young adults. Although reimbursable snacks may be served instead of a meal, USDA encourages emergency shelters to ensure that young people receive the maximum nutrition benefit from the program, which is three full meals. And all meals are served free of charge and claimed at the free rate. Next, please. So now let's turn to at-risk centers. During COVID-19, ARP also authorizes USDA to reimburse meals and snacks served to young adults under age 25 as part of the assistance they receive at emergency shelters that participate in CACFP as at-risk after-school care centers. Next. So for CACFP purposes, at-risk center is defined in the regulations as an organization that provides non-residential after-school care to young people age 18 or under in low-income areas. Although emergency shelters may participate as at-risk centers in any location. Next, to participate in CACFP, an at-risk center must be a public or private nonprofit organization that provides non-residential outside school time education and enrichment to young people age 18 or under. There are no area eligibility restrictions for emergency shelters applying as at-risk centers and no federal licensing requirements. However, at-risk centers have to meet any state or local licensing requirements, as well as health and safety standards. And although an at-risk center may enter into an agreement directly with the state agency, again, it may be easier to participate through an existing sponsoring organization. USDA also encourages states to streamline paperwork for day-to-day -day operations to make it easier for at-risk centers to participate. Next, please. So, as I said, at-risk centers must offer programs that include education or enrichment activities. And ARP requires young adults to receive food and other non-residential assistance. So to give you some examples, at-risk centers could provide mentoring, job training, substance abuse treatment, crisis intervention, or other types of enrichment, education, or uh, assistance. Next. And at-risk centers may claim reimbursement for serving one meal and one snack each day to each young person under age 25. Again, using the meal pattern for ages 13 through 18. Larger portions may be served to meet the nutritional needs of growing teens and young adults, and the meals and snacks are served free, and they're claimed at the free rate. Next. So why should an emergency shelter or an at-risk center participate in CACFP? Well, participation makes a steady, reliable source of federal money available to provide meals and snacks that complement the services that these organizations already provide. CACFP also teaches important lessons in planning and preparing nutritious meals with free online information on healthful eating, menu planning, food purchasing, recipes, food safety, and nutrition education. And the meal patterns provide guidance on the minimum number of components and amounts of food which must be served as part of a reimbursable meal. They provide flexibility to encourage 
program operators to offer a wider variety of foods and to make accommodating special dietary needs easier. Next, please. And as USDA said in the implementation guidance, retroactive reimbursement is available for meals and snacks that were served beginning on March 11. Emergency shelters and at-risk centers should contact their state agency to submit revised March 2021 claims for reimbursement if necessary. Next. So let's look at some of the questions we have been asked. And if you have any questions now, you can write them into the chat. So first, um, how can emergency shelters and at-risk centers participate in CACFP? Well, there are two options, either as an independent center or as a facility under a sponsoring organization. And as I've said, less paperwork may make it easier to participate as a sponsored facility. Next. Why are for-profit at-risk centers in CACFP not eligible under ARP? Well, at-risk centers under ARP must be emergency shelters. And although an at-risk center may be for-profit, an emergency shelter must be public or private nonprofit. Uh, next. What records are required to support emergency shelters claims for reimbursement? Well, emergency shelters must keep attendance, meal counts, and a list of young people by an, a name or some other identifier and date of birth. There is no need, however, to separately track participation of young adults from other meal service recipients. Uh, next. So how do emergency shelters document that they operate a nonprofit food service? Well, all that USDA requires is a simple record of food service revenues and expenditures that demonstrates that the CACFP reimbursement is used to support and improve the meal service for young people. Next. So what if you want to participate or need information, what do you do next? Well, please reach out to your state agency the USDA website has contact information for all of the state agencies. And there are also lots of resources on program requirements, nutrition, and nutrition education on our website. Next. And here is a list to connect you to some of those resources that are available. Next. Remember, USDA's Food and Nutrition Service works in partnership with state and local agencies to administer CACFP and a wide range of nutrition assistance programs, including SNAP, WIC, school lunch and school breakfast, USDA Foods, and the Summer Food Service Program. All of these programs work together to help increase food and nutrition security, to protect children and low-income households from hunger. Next. So here, let's recap. There's a new benefit that provides CACFP meals to young adults under age 25 and CACFP reimbursement for emergency shelters and at-risk centers. All other operational and meal service requirements for emergency shelters and at-risk centers apply. Retroactive reimbursement is available and please remember that your state agency is here to help. Please contact the state agency um, in your state for more information and technical assistance. And now um, I'll turn this back to Jerry. Thanks. Thank you, Susan, for your excellent and informative presentation. That was super helpful. We really all appreciate it. So <clears throat> next, let me go over the rest of the agenda. So we're gonna start with Barbara Duffield, who is the Executive Director for Schoolhouse Connection. Barbara is really a well-respected leader and she will give us the context for homeless youth during this difficult time. We also wanna once again, thank her for her role in planning this webinar. 
Then after that, we will hear from Susana Reza, who is the executive director of El Paso, the El Paso Human Services. Now, Susana is really the person that we should thank for the idea to extend CACFP to use serving homeless shelters, because Susanna has been lobbying for this for years as the president of the CACFP National Forum. She would always talk about her program and say, look, CACFP can't be used for the youth serving shelters from 18 to 24. We really need to do something about this. And we finally got our chance with the American Rescue Plan, and we do also expect to continue working with Susanna and all of you to try to make this permanent in the upcoming child nutrition reauthorization. But in addition to Susanna doing all this wonderful work as part of her agency, which is broad reaching and helps so many children in El Paso, she um, has also had this leadership position, which I wanted to make sure to point out again, because she's the reason that we knew to ask for this. So thank you, Susanna. So next we're gonna hear from Robert S. Jones. He's the director of the government programs for nutritional development services of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Robert is also a leader in CACFP. His program at the Archdiocese serves many different kinds of organizations um, and makes sure that children uh, throughout Philadelphia and beyond get healthy meals. So he is calling in actually from um, a remote working spot from his office because he's always out helping all the different organizations um, who are trying to use CACFP to serve meals and snacks. And he is so dedicated to coming and sharing uh, the excellent operations that his organization uses to use CACAP and homeless shelters that he's calling in. So thank you so much to Robert. Then we will hear from um, Brianna Larson Johnson, who is the development and volunteer manager at Home Stretch. Home Stretch is an innovative organization. And in fact, um, we our communications director is on the board of Home Stretch, and that's how we got to hear about their good work using CACAP in their child care. And then we will finish up with Katie Jacobs, who is FRAC's um, Early Childhood Development and Sustainability Programs Associate. And she is gonna bring you a hot off the press outreach toolkit for this new expansion of CACFP to use serving shelters. So let me now um, turn it over to Barbara. Great, thank you very much, Jerry. Um, we are thrilled to be a part of this webinar, thrilled to be working collaboratively with our partners on this important new policy. Um, next slide, please. Um, for my piece, my piece of the webinar today, I really wanna just sort of paint a picture and some context for the importance of this expansion by talking a little bit about youth and young adult homelessness and the impact of the, of, of the pandemic. Um, this slide shows you the different pathways into youth and young adult homelessness. And for those of you who are working with youth serving programs, um, you know this, whether you're on the shelter side or the school side, you know this well, um, but this may be some new information for those of you for whom youth and young adult homelessness is, is a new topic. So as you can see from the slide, there are different pathways into homelessness for youth and young adults. Um, and any one of these could be uh, an experience that a young person has uh, either singularly or together. So we know that many young people, for example, are experiencing homelessness on their own, um, not in the custody of a parent or guardian, um, not connected to their family because of abuse or neglect, parental substance abuse and mental illness is common, prior experiences of foster care. We know that nearly one third of youth and young adults who are homeless had some experience in foster care, um, many told to leave at their 18th birthday. For many, in fact, over one third uh, are experiencing homelessness um, and they had a death of a parent or a caregiver. So that loss of, of family was a contributing factor to their homelessness. And for nearly one quarter of youth who are experiencing homelessness on their own, they were also homeless as part of, the, part of a family. So again, as I said, many different pathways and many of these intersect. Another piece to call out about, these, about the context for youth and young adult homelessness, of course, is in the pandemic. We know that many of these um, experiences were exacerbated for young people. More challenges, more family stressors because of the economy, because of COVID-19, um, more barriers to accessing services. Um, certainly many young people experiencing homelessness directly as a result of a death or of, of a parent or caregiver uh, due to COVID-19. So many challenges pre-pandemic. In fact, on the next slide, I'll show you a little bit about um, the scope and the, the point here is to say that youth and young adult homelessness is a pervasive 
problem was pervasive pre-pandemic and, and is even more so now. So the data that you have on this slide uh, doesn't come from the HUD, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. The HUD counts are a narrow definition and a narrow methodology often miss young people, nor does it come from the U.S. Department of Education. So again, the school counts of K through 12 anyway are much better, a more realistic definition, better methodology. There's a federal right to go to a school if you're experiencing homelessness and a requirement to identify. But of course, schools will miss young people too, and then they'll certainly miss youth who are not school age. So this, uh, the numbers here come from Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago, and this is based on a nationally representative uh, phone survey. So you could see 3.5 million young adults, 18 to 25, experienced homelessness on their own over the course of a year. That's one in 10. For ages 13 to 17, 700,000 youth are one in 30. And another important fact uh, about uh, youth and young adult homelessness that we've learned from Chapin Hall is that 43% of homeless young women aged 18 to 25 are also parenting um, and are parenting uh, approximately 1.1 million children. So pre-pandemic, the population of youth and young adults, again, was widespread, often very hidden. And I should note too, that the prevalence of youth and young adult homelessness is the same in suburban, rural, and urban areas. It's often thought of as an urban issue. It's not, it is pervasive across our country. Again, that was pre-pandemic. And the next slide, um, with a little bit about what we know about the impact of COVID-19 on young adults. So as I mentioned, um, the reports that we hear from service providers, young people are staying in shelter longer because there's even fewer places for them to go. Uh, they are moving more frequently because of the, some of the tenuous situations that they're staying in are disrupting um, their uh, relationship with the families, maybe even more uh, strained, and they face even greater obstacles to having their basic needs met. The information on this slide comes from a study that just came out two weeks ago, again, by Chapin Hall and also Howard University, that looks at the impact of the pandemic on young adults. Um, and there is a significant impact, particularly for 18 to 25 year olds. So again, I won't read the statistics to you on the slide, but you can see that many have had too little to eat. Um, many have no confidence in their ability to pay rent. Again, just looking at the economy um, and the impact of job loss, particularly for young adults who don't yet have the job skills, particularly if they don't have a college education or even a high school degree, very negatively impacted by the employment situation and are less able to pay their rent and significant racial and ethnic disparities in terms of the impact of COVID-19 on young adults too. So all of this is to paint a picture of a great, great need and a great, great importance for us to roll up our sleeves and work together to make sure that these provisions are implemented robustly so that young people have access to uh, healthy meals and snacks through the CACFP program. And with that context, I wanna turn it over next to Susanna. Thank you, Barbara. Hello to everyone. I would like to thank all those who work on this provision, uh, which now allows reimbursement for meals and snacks that are served to young children, um, young adults in the CACFP. Uh, and I hope the conversations continue long after the provision, uh, short term provision expires. Barbara's presentation spoke to the types of situations that we see with our young adults in our various programs that assist homeless youth within our own organization. Uh, I am the executive director of El Paso Human Services Incorporated, which is a private nonprofit multi-purpose organization. I'm also a board member and past president of the National CACFP Forum. Our agency has been providing social services in El Paso County in far west Texas since 1984. And our mission is to empower children, youth, and families in crisis through the provision of quality and individualized services. We've successfully worked for the last 37 years in collaboration with federal, state, and local agencies in order to better serve children, youth, and families in our region. We're a border community with Mexico, and our population has free mobility within the two cities of El Paso, Texas, and Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, although it is now limited to some individuals due to COVID. This is in part because the border is closed to those with non-essential travel. Some of our youth have family and friends on both sides of the border, as do most of us who live in this region. I tell you this because the higher percentage of youth served by our agency are persons of color, with approximately 85% of them of Latino origin. 
The majority is of Mexican descent. However, we have also served young adults who have crossed the border from Central America, coming from Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Honduras. Food insecurity is very high among these populations within the U.S. and is especially true for those coming from outside of the U.S. Our agency has operated an emergency shelter for homeless male youth ages 18 to 24 for the past nine years. We provide overnight shelter, support services, and case management to approximately 80 male youth on an annual basis. Female youth may also be housed in hotels. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted many individuals and households in El Paso, and especially persons who are considered high risk for homelessness, such as unaccompanied youth, parenting youth, and children of parenting youth. In fact, our agency alone has, been, has seen a significant increase in intakes in our youth-focused emergency shelter and our rapid rehousing programs, as we have served well over 150 youth this past year alone. We also provide transitional housing programs for former foster youth and victims of crime. The Winchester House, as you see pictured here, is the only emergency shelter in our community serving this population of youth ages 18 to 24. Other shelters in El Paso are working with families and are offering shelter to younger unaccompanied youth. These children and youth are able to participate under CACFP and until now, the older youth did not qualify. This new CACFP provision will assist our shelter in feeding young adults healthy meals and snacks, as well as provide us with financial resources to be able to provide these meals. In the past couple of years, we've received limited funds and resources for feeding our shelter clients from FEMA. This funding was under the Emergency Food and Shelter Program. And they were paying us a set fee per meal, which is much lower than the CACFP reimbursement and does not have nutritional criteria for the types of meals served. And to the end of June of this year, we were receiving prepared food under this program from a local restaurant. That funding was exhausted last month, and there are no further funds available for our agency due to funding competition brought on by COVID. And I find this to be true with other counterparts serving youth who don't qualify for services under CACFP and also fall short on resources to feed this young adult population. Our agency has been a CACFP sponsor since 1984. So we have extensive experience in sponsoring daycare homes, center at risk sites and summer program sites. With our experience as a provider of services to homeless youth, coupled with being a sponsor, we can offer the food services in our shelter as a CACFP affiliated site as well as sponsor other youth shelter and youth serving programs in our area. We have CACFP staff that provides training, technical assistance, software monitoring and meal prep and meal service uh, services. We will be setting up the meal service to homeless youth out of our Winchester House emergency shelter, which houses a minimum of 15 youth at any one time. Since this is a short term provision and it's difficult to hire food staff right now, we do not want to hire a permanent cook for the program at this time. Our plan is to use local job form as a resource and get a student or students from their center's culinary arts school under the hospitality division so that they can prepare and serve nutritious balanced meals at our shelter. Another option for cooks is that we will explore using students from our local community college culinary school as well. This approach allows job corps and community college students who are many young adults also ages 18 to 24 to complete their work-based learning with practical on the job training at our shelter. This in turn allows our shelter youth to see these students in action. The students will be trained and supervised to follow CACFP requirements with our experienced CACFP staff. This will be done on site at the Winchester House for implementation of our homeless shelter feeding program. Our homeless program caseworkers refer homeless youth to the local job corps for residential housing, career planning on the job training and job placement and counseling. And so we feel that this is a good partnership between both of our organizations. The meals will be prepared daily for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <clears throat> and then will be left in the refrigerator to be heated and served at mealtime. Shelter staff who have food handlers cards will distribute the meals daily. 
including weekends. We identify and pay one of our youth participants to distribute meals on weekends when we have security guards, but when shelter staff are not always available. Local city inspections are scheduled at the shelter and will need to be in compliance with city ordinances, which may require modifications to our current kitchen. We're planning to pay for modifications at our Winchester house uh, with care shelter funds that we currently have. We're very excited to implement the homeless shelter feeding program in our community. This program will benef be beneficial to our most vulnerable youth population, and we're very ready to put this provision into place. So we're very excited and uh, and welcome this new funding opportunity. I will now turn it over to my friend and colleague, Robert Jones. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Jerry had asked me uh, to provide some thoughts, uh, uh, some general thoughts about our organization's long history, so it may be some frontline perspective of working with emergency shelters. So uh, I serve with an organization called Nutritional Development Services, um, better known simply as NDS. NDS is an agency within the Archdiocese of Philadelphia established nearly 50 years ago, initially to enable the Archdiocesan parochial schools to participate in the National School Lunch Program. Our reach, reach soon expanded to add sponsorship of the Summer Food Service Program and the Child and Adult Care Food Program in response to the many requests that we received to serve children throughout the greater Philadelphia region. NDS now serves more than 6 million meals annually across the various federal child nutrition programs. Under our CACFP sponsorship, which includes child care centers, at risk after school programs, and emergency shelters, all sites with which we partner are, are unaffiliated. The six emergency shelters that we serve are the smallest and most unique piece of our CACFP work. Looking across all of Pennsylvania, there are only 21 emergency shelters that operate under CACFP, 13 of these being in Philadelphia. So it is clear that compared with the other prongs of CACFP, centers, homes, and the at-risk sites, that emergency shelter participation is small, though certainly vital. Allow me to provide a brief history since the inclusion of emergency shelters under the federal child nutrition programs has a special connection to NDS. Around 1990, before my time with NDS, our then director and cardinal, testified in DC about the need for meal reimbursement for children in shelters, similar to what was then long established for children in schools and daycares. NDS was provided the opportunity to test this possibility through a collaboration with USDA called the Homeless Children Demonstration Pilot Program. Given the success of the pilot, in 1994, the then newly named Homeless Children Nutrition Program was implemented nationally. It remained under the direct oversight of the USDA, not the states. It had multiple restrictions. It was not entitled. Sponsors had to fill out an annual grant application for limited funding. It only covered children from birth through five years, and a sponsor could only serve a maximum of five shelters, which we readily did. In the child nutrition reauthorization of 1998, emergency shelters were subsumed under CACFP which now allowed the shelters to participate with entitled status, and sponsors were no longer limited to a certain number of shelters. At this time, the cutoff age was extended through 12 years to be in conformity with daycare sites. The Philadelphia shelters that were not able to be previously sponsored by our office, given the former cap of five, moved under the city of Philadelphia, which continues to sponsor its six affiliated shelters through its Office of Supportive Housing. At that time, NDS strongly encouraged the city to participate and trained the city's shelters on how to operate CACFP. It was the Child Nutrition Reauthorization of 2004 that raised the age limit to 18, 
for residents of emergency shelters to receive CACFP meal reimbursement. We are grateful for and have already embraced this new pandemic related opportunity for shelters to receive meal reimbursement for young adults ages 19 through 24 and have already filed our first claim for these meals. To date, our office has not seen a large number of meals served in this new age group, but again, it's, it's a new provision. But certainly any funding that shelters receive through CACFP is crucial to enable them to provide enhanced nutrition to children, youth, and now young adults. Compared with traditional childcare centers, shelters enjoy some relative ease of CACFP participation. There is no child enrollment form and no income eligibility form. Meals served are reimbursed at the free rate. All of the shelters under our sponsorship claim breakfast, lunch, and supper, which is also distinct given that traditional daycare providers can claim no more than two meals and one snack or one meal and two snacks per child per day. Also helpful point of service meal reporting can simply be a count. Our sites use tally marks. Since all meals are free, the reporting does not have to be child specific. Besides the ability to claim breakfast, lunch, and supper, there is another interesting dynamic to our sponsored shelters meal service. For the traditional daycare centers and at-risk after-school programs that operate under our sponsorship, NDS creates the menus and delivers the meals. In the shelters, since the family eats together, for example, the mother and her child or children, the shelters provide a uniform meal for all residents, crafting their own menus and procuring their own food items. As their sponsor, we provide training and monitoring. We review their menus, their food costs and operating labor costs, process reports and funnel reimbursement back to the shelter for the claimable meals. Since CACFP has set meal patterns and components and has now evolved some standards for sugar and fat content and whole grain rich items. Interestingly, the meals served to benefit not only the program eligible children and youth, but likewise provide the adults and residents with improved nutrition since they received the same meal. Over the years, several shelters have also sought our guidance for obtaining additional nutrition education for adults. So participating in the CACFP program seems to heighten overall dietary awareness. Also gathering and understanding food labels and implementing standardized recipes as dictated by CACFP has helped the shelters improve the performance, consistency, and quality of their food service operation. Please be aware, however, that food sourcing for the shelters can be challenging. Some items are purchased, some are donated, some come from a food bank or quasi food bank environment. Shelters operate with minimal resources and they require ongoing support from our office to make certain that they meet CACFP meal requirements within fast paced shifting circumstances. The final monthly served menu can be significantly different than the originally planned menu filled with changes and substitutions. In conclusion, I would like to share some simple observations in no particular order regarding the participation of emergency shelters in CACFP. I must also give a shout out to Dawn McCoy who manages our emergency shelter CACFP on a daily basis. Dawn provided me some insights into what has worked well at shelters to maximize participation and ensure that children and youth receive proper meals. First, one important distinction to bear in mind with shelters is the presence of the parent with the child at mealtime. This, of course, is different than the experiencing of monitoring um, centers and after school programs. It was this variation that I think most impacted me during my early visits to shelters. It is essential to respect the parents privacy, dignity and autonomy while doing your work. The least intrusive you are, the better. Second, some shelters have a requirement that all residents come to the meal service. Since adults and consequently their children may otherwise use SNAP or other dollars to purchase outside food and skip the more wholesome meal provided by the shelter. 
Third, the shelters that we sponsor all have an upfront understood requirement that the child must receive the complete meal. This eliminates the possibility of the parent refusing meal components for the child and the child not receiving a balanced claimable meal. Lastly, since children and youth may interact with the food service worker or workers multiple times each day, it is important that this staff create a welcoming and supportive environment. This makes mealtime a safe, pleasant experience at a challenging time in residents' lives. I think I'm close to, or maybe over my time, so I'll end here. Uh, my email address is on the slide. Uh, certainly always feel free to contact me should I be able to provide you with any help. And it is now my pleasure uh, to turn the presentation over to Brianna. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. And good afternoon, everyone. I thank you so much to the hosts for inviting Homestretch to participate in this event this afternoon. Next slide, please. So the mission of Homestretch is to empower homeless parents with children to rebuild their lives by giving them the skills, knowledge, and hope that they need to become self-sufficient. We're quite unique in that we have a very holistic approach and really treat the whole family. To talk a little bit about the implementation uh, of this program, I just wanna add a little bit more color to what the program can look like uh, on the ground. Students benefit from a nutritious breakfast, lunch, and afternoon snack daily. And they fo we follow appropriate, age appropriate meal patterns. Uh, lunches were procured through a contract with a local catering company called the Good Food Company, and we absolutely love working with them. So children receive daily fresh, uh, made from scratch, hot lunches. And the goal was simply to ensure that students were provided with healthy and balanced meals as a regular part of their day. Staff also participated in ongoing training to administer the food program. We've also continued uh, our garden and nutrition program beginning the year with a study on squash. Students studied the different types of squash and cooked their own squash soup. Students also made salad, homemade dressing, and trail mix during cooking lessons. The farm to table curriculum concepts have been enriching and complementary, a complementary element to the meals provided through CACFP. Most recently, Kids Stretch students have been growing blueberries, carrots, cucumbers, lettuce, and strawberries in this garden that we've created for them. And they've made spinach salad, strawberry smoothies, and strawberry popsicles, and have tested their favorite ways to eat uh, blueberries and yogurt or oatmeal or salad. They have a blast with that. So the, there are benefits of this are many. Uh, the biggest one is that students start their day full and, and ready to learn. You can imagine how hunger would adversely affect the physical energy or even the behavioral uh, state of a child. We've also seen a significant shift in the nutritional value provided through these meals. They're just a lot more balanced. Another wonderful thing is that the burden on the parent uh, that is trying their best to just get through the day has been alleviated. I mean, when meals are served at home, often there's not repeated exposure to foods, but we've been able to repeatedly introduce students to uh, food so that at some point they've really grown to love certain fruits and vegetables. Some of the students' favorites include yellow peppers and chicken and quiche. And so even though we're a small program, we've been really committed to make sure that we could provide this and we're so happy that uh, the youth are enjoying these benefits. So that was just a quick little snapshot of what the program looks like for us. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Katie. Thank you, Brianna. And so now that we've heard all of the valuable information from USDA and providers on implementing CACF, 
CRP at shelters using the American Rescue Plan provision, I'm going to talk about the outreach toolkit that FRAC has created to help you, CACFP partners and shelter partners, to spread the word about this program and the provision to additional shelters. Next slide. And so the toolkit we created has materials for a range of communications channels, social media, sample emails, flyers, press release, and fact sheets to help you get the word out in, in all of those communications channels. Next slide. And so there's multiple versions of the social media graphics and captions, and I'm gonna run through each of the, the materials that we have within the toolkit. And each of the social media graphics are optimized for various social media platforms. And there's there's multiple color and picture options that you can choose from. Next slide. And all of the social media graphics can be downloaded as um, picture images. So those are ready to use. Click and click and go. But you can also download them as a PowerPoint so that they can be customized with your specific logo, state information, or, or additional contact information that you would like um, shelters or others to know. Next slide. And we also have flyers, and the one page flyers can be used in multiple settings to quickly provide information on what CACFP does, how the American Rescue Plan expanded this program, where individuals can go to receive more information. And these flyers are completely customizable as well. Excellent. We also have two fact sheets that provide more detailed information on CACFP, including how it can be used at shelters, the benefits of the program, including the benefits to the, the shelters, but also the benefits to the participants, those that receive the meals, including information on how um, shelter providers can apply to the program going to their state agency. Next slide. And so now that you have all of these outreach materials, you might be thinking about who can I reach out to? And so this list, um, which I have a, one a really big thank you to our co-sponsor Schoolhouse Connection for compiling this list, uh, is a really good place to start. And so all of the outreach materials discussed and the links to these grantees, locations, and, and members will be sent out in the follow-up email so that you have them all in one place. They'll be packaged and compiled. And next slide. And if you have any questions about the outreach materials or this provision, you can reach out to FRAC and me specifically, Katie Jacobs at kjacobs at frac.org. And with that, I will pass it off to Susanna for the Q&A portion of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Those are very uh, formative and valuable resources that we all are going to be able to use. So we're opening it up for questions right now, and uh, we have a few minutes for that. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come in, um, and I think these are addressed to USDA. So I'll ask the first question. Can you confirm that a youth shelter serving only 18 to 24 year old youth is eligible to receive CACFP meal reimbursement under this new expansion? Can you guys see me? Because I'm terrible. Um, can you hear me and see me? <laughs> Yes, we can. <laughs> okay, great. So I received that in the chat as well. And someone had just nailed it out of the park when they asked. Um, some 18 year olds will be offended by this, but our regulations define emergency shelters define them as children. Um, so, um, but yes, if you're serving 18 year olds, you may now expand 18 to 24. If you serve 18 to 24, you may now also so use this provision. So for the record, yes, you may um, utilize this provision if you serve 18 to 24. Um, I hope that is clear. Thank you, Angela. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I have another question. Uh, I don't okay. know if you want to read it, if you can see it on the chat, or if you'd like for me to go over it. Um, well, it's what question do you have? Because I, I have can a single organization operate as multiple types of CACFP centers, for example, as an at risk program and emergency shelter. Uh, of course, as long as meals are not double counted. Um, yes, you can. An organization can have, and there may be someone. I know other folks are on this call that answer this more eloquently than me. And um, but yes, you can have. Um, people can offer different types of programs, but sure, you can't. You have. You have to serve. One child cannot eat multiple meals, obviously. Um, you know, for many reasons. But yes, you may offer different programs. And I don't know if someone else wants to jump in and say that more eloquently than me. <laughs> 
But then I also saw some questions on the chat that I thought we could answer. Um, for example, someone said, I work with families that weave, being that there are parents and children with this program also qualify. Absolutely. Just only the meals that um, are feeding the children would qualify. Did I get that right, Susan? The meals that are served to the children and to the adults who are under age 25. Oh, very good. So it's, um, you know, young parents as well as um, young children would be. Thank eligible. you for catching that. See, this is why we have a team. And I didn't know if there were any others that, um, and someone, and let's see, what was the other one here? Um, someone actually asked about if this was an ongoing thing. And I did, you know, this is just a temporary authority um, during, and it lasts as long as the um, health emergency is in place. But, um, you know, I think there's some folks on this call that would like to see it implemented um, permanently, but that is not, I'm a, I'm a public servant. So I know that that, uh, but I hope folks that are interested in this, I think you can lobby Congress. Um, um, and then, but however, I cannot do such a thing as a federal servant. <laughs> and but someone asked if it was ongoing, so that's why I'm answering that. Um, so get that in the transcript. So the other thing, someone asked about the meal pattern. They said, is there a different meal pattern for young adults 19 through 24, or can we use the meal pattern for 13 to 18? We have at-risk centers. Did someone, one of my staff wanted to answer that one? Or former staff, or? <laughs> yes, um, again, um, Angela and everyone, um, the meal pattern for eight, ages 13 through um, 18 would be the appropriate meal pattern to follow. Um, and as we mentioned, um, larger portions can always be served to meet the needs of the um, um, participants. Um, the meal patterns give you the minimum amounts of food that are, is eligible for re reimbursement, but you can always serve larger portions. And then they say, what what meals are emergency shelters allowed to claim? Uh, emergency shelters um, can claim um, th three meals or two meals and one snack, or even two snacks and one meal. So it's uh, up to three meal services for each eligible um, um, young person. Um, however, as I mentioned, um, USDA always um, emphasizes the importance of trying to ensure that young people get the um, maximum nutrition benefit of the program. So that's why we would encourage um, the service of three complete meals, uh, breakfast, lunch, and supper. Thank you, ladies. I think we are running out of time. I will turn it back over to Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, um, in conclusion, I want to thank all of our speakers today, not only for your excellent and informative presentations, but also for your leadership, your hard work, and for putting your heart into all that you do to make sure that folks can use CACFP to feed families, children, and youth who are experiencing homelessness. On behalf of FRAC and our co-sponsors, Feeding America and the Health Connection. I want to thank our speakers, which I just did. And I also want to thank all of you in the audience who joined us today. As I said in the beginning, you're all going to be crucial to making this new expansion a success. Thank you. And that concludes our webinar.